dreams. <laughs> That's what I've been trying to say all this time. And so when I was a jerk husband, I just thought, you know, I, I worked all day and golfed all the time. I was either working or golfing. Karen resented it. And I thought, you know, I'm just going to walk in the house and she's going to re realize that she's married to Mr. Wonderful and she's just going to instantly, you know, gravitate toward me. That's not the way that it happened. She treated me better than I deserved, but I did not get the response I was looking for from my wife until I began to serve her. And when I put, I literally hung my golf clubs up for several years, and it healed our marriage. Now, I played golf last week. Golf is of the Lord. <laughs> Let me say that right now. But it, became, it came before Karen. And the night that our marriage was healed, I told Karen, you come first. I'm not, I'm not going to play golf anymore. And I began to serve my wife. And let me just tell you something. She blossomed like a rose. And the response that I never saw before, I saw then. And I've been married 40 years. And we don't have a perfect marriage, but we have a great marriage. And the greatest marriage is two servants in love. The worst marriage is two selfish people in love. And the way that God designed it, the way God designed marriage is two servants in love. A woman serving her husband with an honoring spirit and a man laying his life down with a sacrificial spirit for his wife. Literally, the roles make us attractive to each other. The second thing, the roles in Ephesians 5 release the potential in our spouse. We, we release our potential. Remember Genesis 2.18, God said, it is, It's not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper comparable to him. If we could reach our potential on our own, God would not have created marriage. Now listen to this. A 48-year-old married man has a 90% chance of reaching the age of 65. A 48-year-old single man has a 60% chance of reaching the age of 65. Men are better with women in their lives. We're better. They, they, they have a, we ha take, uh, men uh, do less risky behavior. We eat better. We, we eat more of the right foods. Women take care of you. Women, you know, they, they make you do the right thing. You're, you're there, we're just, I'm, I'm trying to give men an opportunity to say amen. I'm, you know, th thank you. It, it was slow. Thank God somebody said amen. Okay. But we are better with women in our lives. Okay. So God made us to where when we're together, we can fulfill the potential that we have. This is an interesting little theological point. The devil never attacked Adam when he was by himself. Only when Eve came in his life did he attack. Because he knew that by himself he could never reach his potential. But as soon as God created marriage, he knew that mankind could achieve their potential. God's role for men is to nourish and cherish their wives as we would our own bodies. Every husband's job is to bring his wife to her full potential. When I got married, I was a chauvinist. I came out of a family of chauvinists. Men were better than women, and women served men hand and foot, and, that, and we just thought that was great. I just thought that's perfect. My grandfather never dialed the telephone for himself, never, never did anything around the house. My grandmother would wait on him hand and foot. I saw that growing up, and I thought, I want one of those. <laughs> and I married Karen, and she did not train well. I just thought, I've got somebody I can't train very well. So I was trying to train her, you know, to be like all the other docile women in our family, but she had more spirit than that. And she would stand up to me lovingly, but she just wasn't going for it because I was a male chauvinist pig. I really was. And my concept of marriage was she's here for me and men are better than women. And when I come home from work, I did my job. I brought home a paycheck. And everything else she's going to do while I sit here in my chair. And that was my concept. That was my full concept of marriage. Let me tell you what my concept is now. The most precious thing that God ever gave me is my wife. And I'll stand before him one day and give an account of what I did with the most precious thing he ever gave me. And she, he made her and her mother's womb to be someone great. God did not make men great. He made men and women great. And our job is to bring each other to our full potential. Husband is a farming term, and it means a grower. And when it says that we are to nourish and cherish our wives, those are gr farming terms. The word nourish means to feed to maturity, and the word cherish means to protect. It mean, literally means to keep warm, to keep a plant warm so nothing can damage it. A good husband is a greenhouse. 
He provides an environment of nourishment and protection so his wife can thrive. And so what every husband should do with his wife as his partner is to find out why did God create my wife? What is she supposed to be? An astrophysicist? A lawyer? A stay-at-home mom? A worship leader? A Bible study teacher? What is she supposed to be? And then to my hurt... I will sacrifice anything in my life to make sure that she becomes the person that God made her to be. And there's not one woman that minds that. Every woman, that's the way that God made marriage, is that I'm a grower, I'm a farmer. Who am I raising? My wife. Not to be what I want her to be, to be what God wants her to be. Not with that chauvinism that puts her down, but literally the Spirit of Christ that raises her up. Lay your life down the way that Christ did the church. Let me tell you the way that Christ laid his life down. He died for us, and we're now seated with him in heavenly places, and we'll rule and reign for him with him for eternity. Jesus doesn't put, put me down. Jesus lifts me up. Jesus makes me into the best person I can be, and that's what a godly husband does. We talk about women for just a minute. Okay, so men, women become in an atmosphere of security and nourishment. They just do. When they're being taken care of, when they're when someone is pastoring them, I'm talking about a husband, is pastoring them and caring for them, they become in that environment. Men are different. Our number one need is not security. Our number one need is honor. So here's what the Bible says to women. Submit is to the Lord. That means honor as you would the Lord. Treat your husband the way you would Jesus. Proverbs 31 is an interesting scripture. It talks about the excellent wife, and it says her husband is an elder in the gates of the city, but it attributes it to her, not him. The excellent wife produced an elder by the way she treated her husband. He wasn't one, but he became one in her presence. Again, men become in an atmosphere of respect and honor. This is an interesting one. 1 Peter 3 says that Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, and you have become her children. It's talking to, to women. And I told Karen, I said, Karen, this is the 21st century. You don't have to call me Lord. It's something like, oh, great one. I mean, I, I'm a humble man. And, but literally, the Bible says for women to respect their husbands. So I said that a good husband is a good greenhouse, but a good wife is a good cheerleader. Men love cheerleaders. I don't know about women's sports, but I'm telling you something. The reason there's cheerleaders in men's sports is because we like that. We like a bunch of cute girls sitting there saying good things about us. We like that. When I played football, we used to run plays at the cheerleaders because we could fall down in front of them and they say something good about us. You know? and so the thing about cheerleaders is they praise everything, every little thing that you do. The cheerleaders are fabulous. They're looking for something that they can praise. Any little thing that happens, they just get their little pom-poms out. And they, yay, yay. Every, it's intermission. We're getting killed. Yay. <laughs> the other thing is they can say something negative in a positive way. They're so cute. They say something. And so the team's getting killed. And here's, here's what they have to say about it. Defense, defense, defense. Hold that line. Hold that line. And now you bunch of sissies, would you hit somebody? My grandmother could tackle him. They don't do that. They stay positive. And so here's the thing that you need to understand about men. Men will do anything for praise. A man will slide down a mountain of razor blades to land in a lake of lemon juice to hear one idiot say, you're the man. We'll go do it again. (laughs) We're crazy over it. It makes us crazy. And so it says for wives to honor their husbands, as they would the Lord. Why? Because that's the environment where we become. We need to hear you say you believe in us, and it hurts us deeply when we think you don't. A good wife is a cheerleader. A bad wife is a critic. Not that you can't say something to your husband that's negative, but how you say it is very critical. And you say it in love, and you tell him that you believe in him and that you love him, and you let the Holy Spirit be the enforcer. But you're not the enforcer. So your husband, how is your husband going to become the man that God wants him to become in an atmosphere of praise? How is your wife going to become the woman that God wants her to become in an atmosphere of security and laying your life down sacrificially for her? Here's the third 
truth about the roles in Ephesians 5. The roles in Ephesians 5 disable our sin natures and keep them from destroying our marriages. 